Welcome to a podcast that has no name and no purpose just yet. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. No, yeah. I'm, I think we, uh, we're starting a, a new podcast here. So we are in the wonderful position to build the whole thing from scratch in front of those people who hopefully find it interesting enough to tune in. Um, maybe we should introduce ourselves a little bit, you know, just for anyone listening figure out who these two wonderful people are that are starting this thing that has no name and no purpose as of this sure. point. Although if somebody finds this first episode and doesn't know either of us, yeah. I'll be very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was just thinking about this too. Like anybody who finds this probably knows its name. The thing is going to have a name. It's probably going to have a highly polished production behind it at this point with like a logo and a fancy jingle and everything. And we're just sitting here and not having any clue whatsoever. But yeah. So I'm just going to start. I'm Arvid. I'm a writer, I think, software engineer and a Twitter person. It's kind of my newest, newest job is being present on Twitter all the time, helping founders, empowering founders, building businesses. And that's what I do. What do you do? And who are you? Yeah, I'm Tyler. Um, the main thing I do right now is I run the Calm Company Fund. Uh, we're an early stage investor. Um, you know, we do a lot of the same stuff that you expect from an investor in terms of providing capital and community and mentorship. But our special spin on things is that we invest in what we call calm companies, basically a more sort of bootstrapper minded approach to, to building companies. Uh, and then if, if Arvid is a professional Twitter person, I'm a semi pro, uh, Twitter person <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> well, you're doing a good job at it. I can say that. Like I'm, uh, I've always been a big fan of your work and the things that you talk about. And obviously we've, we've done stuff together in the past we i don't think we ever really met you know like in person it's which so is crazy uh, yeah <laughs> i guess it's normal now like we, i think that's a covid thing i think without covid we for sure would have met in person in the last couple of years yeah yeah it's it's the whole conference circuit that we probably would both have been on at some point and then would have intersected yeah. at some point but i'm i'm glad that we that we're doing this because i'm excited to uh, um, first off work on things with you yeah, and then likewise. talk about the things that we work on independently with you here as well. I yeah. think that that is how this all came to be, right? The idea mm -hmm. for this podcast that has, as of this moment, no name just yet, <laughs> uh, is that it's a it's an accountability regimen for the both of us to mm -hmm. do the things that we want to do, commit to the things that we want to commit to, and keep pushing forward in our efforts to uh, to get these things done. Both the things that we want to work on together and the things that we work on in, independently. And it's, it's also a way for us to just chat. Like yeah. th that's one of the things that I love about this horrible post COVID world where everybody's just used to talking to people online at this point. And that's how actual relationships are accepted to be like, right? Yeah. That's it's now okay to have a podcast and be friends through that medium, something completely unthinkable a decade ago, <laughs> at least in, in, in my world, I right? might have been different for, for other people in, in other capacities, but I'm, I'm just happy that this is something we can do and something we chose to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that's improved my life the most in this, I would say phase of my life, maybe the last five to seven to 10 years has been the idea of sort of meeting people on the internet through their ideas really like primarily through Twitter, but, but actually it's more like not just because you happen to be somewhere together, but you just meet someone through their ideas and you like their ideas and you exchange ideas with them and then you become friends with them. And then later you like meet up and you have a meal or you have a beer together or, or you end up in the same city together and you become, you know, really great friends. But, um, yeah, it's awesome. Anyway, let's I talk about the, the podcast. <laughs> what are yeah, we doing here? Why are we here? <laughs> Well, that's, that's the thing that this, this podcast like kind of pierces the filter bubble that we're both in, yeah. in, in yeah. it's, uh, like, you know, it allows us to, to actually relate on a, an audio or human speech level, but mm. yeah, what, what is this for? Um, that, yeah. What is this for? <laughs> why why <laughs> well, are we doing this? Maybe. Okay. We can share the basic premise here, which is like, so, you know, we have been, we've been internet friends for a while. We're also kind of working on really interesting sort of complementary things where a lot of the topics that we're working on overlap. And then we're bringing kind of a very different lens to things. Whereas, you know, basically 
I've been really focused on the investing side of things and building a fund that can actually invest in entrepreneurs. And you've been super focused, I would say, on the more like the teaching side of things, basically helping entrepreneurs build the right kind of mental toolkit to succeed as an entrepreneur, irrespective of funding, you know, maybe with a focus on bootstrapping and all that sort of stuff. And and we kind of both identified like, hey, there's a real opportunity here to to kind of formalize some of this educational stuff, right? Take a bunch of the lessons that we feel we've learned and try to step into a space where we can help entrepreneurs move down this, you know, we call it the calm company path, right? You know, sort of point them in that direction because, you know, I think I think I first came to you and I was identifying this problem, which is, you know, we're we're investors and we're kind of downstream of this decision, right? Where founders have already kind of decided to go down this calm company path, despite let's say seeing, you know, the the Silicon Valley path as a, a one of the you know, there's there are several paths, but that's one of the clearer paths. They've already kind of decided decided to go down this path, and we're just waiting for them somewhere down that path to kind of join. And I came to you and I was like, Arvid, we need to like we need to get further down in the path before the fork in the road to help people understand the difference between these two paths. And you're doing really fantastic work on that already. So I was like, can we sort of collaborate on something where we give folks the toolkits at the earlier phases of the decision tree of I mean, maybe they're thinking about just being an entrepreneur or they kind of have an idea or a hunch that they're starting to shape up or they're ready to build their first version. They need to know, do I want to go to an accelerator? Do I want to apply to tech stars or do I want to kind of go down a different path? And uh, we started pulling that thread and kind of came on this sort of code named project of like the calm MBA, right. Of, of giving folks that, that business toolkit to, to build a calm company and to feel sort of empowered to start down that path versus other paths. Um, and so we both basically like high fived on that idea immediately. We we're like, yes, this is a fantastic yeah. idea. And then, um, nothing think, happened. yeah, no, not nothing <laughs> happened. You did a great job of like, you know, firing ahead with some of the core topics and starting to like sketch stuff out and doing the, you know, the process you have, right. Of like you tweet about stuff and you get feedback on it. And then you turn that into like a newsletter or a blog post. That's a little more refined, you know, and you're kind of refining these ideas and you did, I mean, in some ways you already have been, um, well, we both kind of have been doing that part of the process. And then yeah. we haven't really stepped into like that next phase of refinement where it's like, okay, this is going to be real material that we can kind of call a, a course or, or a real, you know, solidified product that, that we can help people, um, uh, choose that path. And so then we, we kind of stumbled a bit <laughs> on that. And I think like many entrepreneurs you struggle with, you have a lot of great ideas and it's hard to, it's hard to know which ones to double down on. It's hard to properly prioritize them. And so uh, yeah, probably maybe like six months have gone by since we both like high five and said great idea and very little kind of progress happened. So we said, you know, you're the, the, you know, one of the biggest proponents of build in public in part for the accountability loops that that uh -huh. creates. So we said, all right, let's do that. So let's just start a podcast and hold ourselves accountable to actually launching this thing. And, and also we can just hang out along the way. You know? Yeah, that's that's exactly why I immediately yeah. said yes, enthusiastically yeah. <laughs> yeah. said yes because I first off I, I just wanted to have a chance to chat with you about all kinds of things, but yeah. then making it about getting further with the the project itself, which is something that I've been yeah like you said working on for half a year on off right and just writing mm -hmm. about topics that kind of fit into it. I, I felt like yeah, it's time to kind of professionalize this and deprofessionalize it in another yes. way, right? Because yes. it becomes less of a just a project if there is a relationship involved. And mm -hmm. I love this about building in public. I'm a, obviously I'm a big fan and I try to do it in everything I do. And I would love to do this for the coming weeks and months and years if, if mm. that ends up being the running length of this very show. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that is that is exactly where I'm at too. Like I'm, I, I've written, I, I counted earlier, 30,000 words just from the articles that I wrote about all the things, right? The, fu mm -hmm. the fundamentals, the mm -hmm. misconceptions of calm businesses and the, the stages, right? Audience building or f figuring out your market and understanding your, your product and what to build and what a good solution looks like and all these tech stack things. I've been writing about them all over yeah, the last half year, but now we have a 30,000 word corpus of something yeah. that 
now can be translated into a myriad of other things. And that is yeah. exactly what is the hardest part about uh, educational work in, in particular. That's how I feel. Like yeah. There are so many ways. This, this could be a video series. This could be a, a just a full length book. This could be anything, right? A, a cohort course. This could be whatever new thing that isn't even invented yet. And it's nice to just take it in an iterative fashion and just go step by step into this whole potential world and make choices, which yeah. is what this format will allow us to do. And yeah. I, I love the idea of today's episode, the very first, or I guess the zeroth episode, the episode <laughs> before, you know, the, the first structurally complete episode to be both about the Com MBA project that we have and the hopefully soon to be named podcast about the project itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think for many people who would like to start a podcast or would mm -hmm. want to communicate more with like other experts or professionals or other beginners in their field, doesn't really matter. Setting up a podcast in itself is scary, particularly mm -hmm. if it's, if it's with somebody else. Yeah. And I mean, you're extremely accomplished in your field and I consider myself to be slightly accomplished in mine. So we, you know, we have to kind of navigate our other professional commitments that we have. And then we have to figure out like, what do we really want to talk about? How long are these episodes going to be, right? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be video or audio, all these questions. And I think we can just go through them, decide on them and both commit to what we want to do and show other people how to negotiate these things with yeah. other people in the field. Because if there's one thing I love, it's when two people hopefully diverse, <laughs> you know, in, in many ways from different industries, different backgrounds come mm -hmm. together and share a journey. That, yeah. that is something that I've, as a podcast listener have loved in, in mm. our field, in the indie hacker bootstrapper world, this has been like the social, um, the software social po podcast, right? With mm -hmm. like, from Michelle Hansen and Colleen Schnettel. That has been great. Sure. They, have, yeah. they just talk about everything that's on their plates and what they do about it and what they've mm -hmm. done last week, what they're going to do next week, <laughs> the projects that are kind of looming over the head or the things they want to do, the things they have to slog through. All of this feels like you're just part of somebody else's uh, life in a way yeah. that the, the big brother show on TV was never meant to be, right? <laughs> you, 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 kind of, you, you look into it, but from a professional angle, not from yeah. a social drama angle, but from, okay, these are people figuring things out and I get to be there for the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love these kind of podcasts, which is why I'm part of it and why I want to keep this going. And mm -hmm. the thing is, I tend to go on tangents a lot. <laughs> in case no. you didn't notice that. So we'll have to kind of learn how to communicate without getting into these, uh, you know, rather sidetracked stories. Or we'll just go on tangents. It's fine. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's the charm. Right? Right? <laughs> we do whatever we want to do. Yeah. So have you considered, um, let, let's go through like the, the, maybe the structural parts of the podcast first, just so, sure. so we make a couple of choices here. Sure. Have you considered an average length that you would want this to be? Knowing that there are people out there who love hour long things and there are people who are out there who can only commit 10 minutes at a time. Have you ever considered where you would like this to end up? I mean, my initial thought, you know, so, I mean, I, I have run zero podcasts. I've been a guest on a, quite a number of them and I listen to a lot of them, but I don't have a lot of, you know, personal experience or, or I would say like raw data. So I would actually defer to you. My intuition on this would be, um, that something in the 40 minute range would be kind of ideal. I, I feel like, um, you know, if you're going to have a super dense, really tightly edited thing, you really want to keep it shorter. But I kind of feel like, you know, people are going to maybe tune in to this and then tune out when they're done, right? And not really feel like yeah. they have to be sort of completionist with every episode yeah. that we produce of this. So if it goes a little longer because we want to talk about something and then it ends up being cool content that we want to chop up because like, you know, at the 41st minute, we have a nice little rant about some topic that mm -hmm. comes up and that turns out to be a great piece for, for Twitter or, or some kind of short form content. I think that's fine. Um, I think more than an hour is probably excessive, you know, um, but I think trying to keep the two of us under significantly under 30 minutes is going to be a challenge. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I very much agree. And I think yeah. that I, I love what you just said about this. You don't have to be a completionist. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I really don't like about certain kind of podcasts where you have to listen to the whole thing because it only yeah. makes sense, like as a package. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
I would rather treat it like a, a TV show that you can tune in and tune out and you'll always find something or maybe that is maybe better or not as good for whatever you need right now. But at yeah. least, you know, it's it, it's going to be there every, I don't know which day of the week this is going to sure. be. We have to discuss that too. But you know, yeah. like the, the kind of, it doesn't have to be epi episodical and it doesn't have to have an overarching narrative because whose journey, whose real life journey ever has a, an overarching narrative, right? That does not exist. Like you, your day just happens to be the way it is. You, you don't mm -hmm. have the, the big story of the day. If at all, it's a, a retrospective on, on mm -hmm. it. Like you look at it from the, like in the past, oh yeah, this turned out to be a day like this, but you never know. So um, I think that's 40 minutes is wonderful. I think we are almost halfway there with this episode. <laughs> so that's, that's an interesting thing already, right? We're yeah. barely scratching the surface at this yeah. point. <laughs> Um, that, that is, yeah, that's definitely something that I would like to do because it's also a, a question of how much commitment can we, as people who have other things in our lives, yeah, put into this, right? which is another build in public thing, right? Building mm -hmm. in public is both building and communicating it in public. And if yeah. you only spend your time communicating, you have very little to build, which makes the things you can talk about very uninteresting because you haven't done anything. Yeah. So, you know, like, a. Mm -hmm. Under an hour is good because it leaves more hours to actually do stuff, which right. is, that's important too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I agree. Love it. So that, that would set the length. We, take, we talked about cadence already, right? We wanted this to be a weekly show. Is that mm -hmm. still the thing? Is that still okay for you? Yeah, I think weekly is great. I mean, and I think that's the right cadence for, you know, like weekly, but, you know, maybe we don't stress if we miss a week, right? You know, we, we strive for mm. weekly. I think doing it in the middle of the week, we're recording this on Wednesday, makes sense. I think I want it to be thoughtful about not doing kind of like Friday was a sort of natural thing in terms of like my energy levels. And I was like, that's mm. too frequently going to get interrupted by travel and vacations. And especially when summer comes around and people want to do summer Fridays and stuff like that. Like, so I think like, afternoons on a Wednesday strive for weekly, but don't stress if we miss a week, that feels like a great cadence, you know, for me, but yeah. Yeah. Midweek is generally nice. Like I've, yeah. I've found that in my own work, like my, my interviews, which I release on Wednesday mornings, mm -hmm. usually get more views immediately because people just have the time compared mm. to Friday where people already kind of zoned out a little bit, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it stretches into the weekend, which is also nice, but it's just the consumer behavior in terms of when people listen to things or watch things. Next yeah. question coming up soon. That <laughs> is um, usually in the middle of the week is more interesting because people are busy with things and they want something to kind of, you know, relax and pull them, pull themselves out of uh, whatever kind of funk they might be in and just have a, be part of a conversation. So mm -hmm. uh, weekly is fine with me. Also love the idea of not stressing a release, which mm -hmm. is, I, I guess, a, a two-sided kind of, you know, double, double-sided blade. Is that, is that the phrase? I don't know. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be problematic for people who really want to listen to this every week. Yeah. Then again, it could just cause anxiety in us, which is not conducive to the further existence of the podcast. So I guess whenever we find time, we try to make it right. That's yeah. just, I would like to see like an 80 or 90% uptime over the year. That would be great. But I, I think that's, the... yeah, I, I think it's important though, because one thing you'll hear, you know, in the advice on launching a podcast, you, like everybody who gets interviewed, you know, that has like a really successful podcast, they say, what are some of the like key things that you give people? And they say, you know, you have to be consistent. You have to be every single week, same time, same day, same, you know, because it becomes embedded as part of people's routine, you know, like, um, and I think they're probably right about that, but also like the most important thing is that you actually do the podcast and you do it for a while. <laughs> you know? And so I think you can take that advice and then be like, right, once we have like a snowballing momentum and this thing is really important, then we'll get there, you know, <laughs> but like, we're not going to say like, we're going to absolutely like re-architect our entire lives around optimizing for this one podcast before we even know if it's interesting to people. Right. You know, so G generally a yeah. good idea with any projects right. that you yeah. might pack, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the whole small bets approach. It's like, look at this, totally. see it for what it is. Don't over commit resources to any one idea. And if it shows promise, like if we get a sponsor, which right. we probably don't even need for this, right? <laughs> at any Sponsored point, rambles. Well, I love that. <laughs> Oh, it depends. But yeah, if, if, yeah. I, I'm, I'm drinking this this wonderful coffee. It, mm -hmm. You know, like we, we can highlight a lot of things that keep us going. Yeah. And Athletic Greens, if you're listening, uh, we're available. Yeah. 
Yeah, Four Sigmatic. Yeah, it actually <laughs> is what I'm drinking, not sponsored, but it should be, maybe. No, but once we have a sponsor, that would be different, right? Because somebody else's money is kind of locked up into you having to commit to this day and time. But if it's a, an accountability thing, then accountability should be something that is at least fed by an internal need to do it. Right? It yeah. shouldn't just be an external pressure for you to keep going because that's kind of, I guess that's why most of us go into entrepreneurship to begin with is not to have that pressure or mm -hmm. at least not the same way you had it before. Yeah. So that's great. I, uh, I like this. I, I would love to do this as often and regularly as we can, because that is the whole point, right? We mm -hmm. want to keep our projects going, but uh, it not having to be happening probably makes it more likely that it will happen in some <laughs> weird reverse psychology thing that's going on there. Cool. Um, yeah. I, I don't have that many questions here. The only other thing that that is maybe really critical to this is, is this going to be an audio or a video show? What do you think? What are your preferences for this? Do you uh, want to do hair and makeup every, every Wednesday? That's kind of the question. I've got these nice studio lights. I mean, I mm -hmm. bought that, uh, that course that you recommended and all that sort of stuff, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be on camera. Yeah, no. <laughs> me too. I don't care. There. I mean, it, let me ask you, I mean, is that really like a difficult decision? I feel like, um, so you, so just so people know, you're sort of manning the logistical side of things in terms mm. of, you know, setting up the, the recording and then whatever happens with the recording after that, I'm obviously happy to pitch in, but I'm deferring to you because you're already running stuff. Um, is it not the case that like, basically we can just export the video file and put it on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what it is. So, yeah, and I'm, and I'm, even, even if it were like requiring an, an edit or something that, mm -hmm. that doesn't really take that much time. The question is like, it's usually, uh, it's twofold. Like it's, it's an equipment thing. Obviously we both have a camera and a, and have a good microphone so that that is not a problem. Mm. And it's, it's also a, a focus thing because mm. I, I've noticed one thing like doing audio only allows you to kind of focus on your thoughts more because you don't have to look anywhere. It's, it's, you know, it's like zoom with the camera off. Yeah. M makes you behave differently and makes you do things differently compared to, you know, having to perform, which this can be, well, it doesn't have to be, I'm still going to be myself here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a, it's a choice that you make. I think we can, we can definitely keep the video. It's also kind of a cannibalizing thing. I've noticing, I'm noticing that with my own podcast because I have it as an audio show and a YouTube video, and they used to be the same content. So depending on where a person would consume it, it would kind of cannibalize off the other platform because you know, somebody who listens, doesn't watch the video and vice right. versa. So numbers would be halved and mm. not that those numbers really matter for an accountability thing between the both of us. Right. But, you know, if it turns out to be spectacularly successful, <laughs> then this becomes an issue. And mm. uh, generally, I think the advice is to uh, that, that I hear a lot is start with one and then add the other sure. instead of kind of cutting back down. But we're going to record it anyway. We don't yeah. necessarily have to release it. That's, that's kind of the idea, right? The audio yeah. part is the most important one because that's what keeps people engaged when they are walking their dog or doing the dishes both activities where you shouldn't be watching a screen. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, yeah. I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think, um, I mean, you know, you, you probably have a better way of articulating this in some of your build in public canon, but something I'm kind of constantly nudging folks on my team to do is just, you know, make sure that you do the recording part of things as you go. And then you can, you can do the, you can, you have to decide to build, to record what you're building. And then mm -hmm. later you can decide how much you want to build in public, right? In the sense that like, we're often doing really cool stuff. And I'm like, you know, folks, make sure that you record like a really quick loom of just how you did that and how you decided about that. Cause then we're going to throw it in a podcast later when we launch the product, we're going to give some behind the scenes about how we built this and it's going to be so cool. But if you don't record in the moment, then you never get around to going back and like re-recording that sort of stuff. So I think that's a, yeah. a useful insight throughout a lot of folks' businesses is like, if you're doing something interesting and you probably are just take a little bit of extra time to make sure that you kind of capture it. And then you can later decide, it, you know, if you want to publish it in this format or that format or edit it or don't edit it, or, you know, whether it's a blog post or a single tweet or whatever, but just like, make sure you take a moment to kind of capture some of the in progress work, because I think that's so powerful when you share it later to give that behind the scenes look. So, um, you know, it's kind of obvious. The whole purpose of this podcast is to do that, but I think that's a little bit more repurposable in a lot of folks' businesses.
I very much regret not taking enough screenshots in the last decade of all the projects yeah. that I was working on. And that yeah. is something that is so easy, particularly with tools that just, uh, you know, allow you to take a full screen screenshot and just save it yeah. somewhere in the Dropbox forever. And you just have it like all the projects that I've been working on as a, as a bootstrap software engineer, I only have like the end results, which is great, right? You know, like it looks cool and all that, but all the little experiments along the way, that is the, the meat of building in public. The meat of building in public is decision-making and the things mm. you did do, the things you didn't do, how they worked out or how they didn't, right? All of this is part of the, the story that you can tell that actually interests people who are on the same journey. Yeah. And if you don't have any recordings and, and the screen grab is nothing but a recording and maybe a very static one, but it is one then you have nothing really to share because it's so hard to communicate things that are visual in mm -hmm. a non-visual medium, like on a podcast, right? That's, that's kind of, if we ever were to share screenshots, we would have to explain a lot, even though, you know, um, it would be so easy on video, but audio, the, the narrative, the, the, the human capacity to mm -hmm. love and tell stories that needs recordings, like kind of artifacts in time and space and mm -hmm. great advice. Like always take uh, screenshots. I take screenshots so deliberately now of mm -hmm. everything. I know that I'm not going to use maybe 90, 95% of these things, yeah. but I don't care. I have them. And if I ever need to go back into something that I did in the past, I can. It's, it's always easy to add more uh, like, oh, no, it's, it's always easy to have enough and takes just some than to add things later that you didn't take before, right? It's, it's kind of, um, yeah, I, I think it just never happens. Happens. You just always yeah. are like, oh, well, I wish I had taken those screenshots. You, yeah. I, I just, you just never go back and recreate it, you know? <laughs> like, okay. uh, we'll see what AI tools will allow yeah. us to do, right? So like there will be like a mid journey, fake history generator <laughs> that will just generate pictures of you when you were a kid and it would just kind uh -huh. of look authentic. That's scary stuff, but it's yeah. very likely already here. In some well, ways. Um, Darby, what do you think about switching gears a little bit and doing a little bit of our accountability work and actually talking about some comments? Yes, games? please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you um, for pulling me back. In. <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. I thought that was good. That was that was a reasonably succinct, you know, meta analysis of the of the podcast. Um, yeah. So I think you know, I, I think we can kind of this is a little bit rehashing some stuff that we've already talked about, but I think maybe we can. I'd be curious, and I think folks would enjoy hearing you talk about how to think through. Like we have this kind of this obvious um, stream of content in the sense that, you know, um, we're constantly getting questions about how to build like this. There's constantly discussions going on on Twitter and, and we have these point of views and, you know, you started writing articles. And so, you know, there's kind of this process where when you have this open-ended exploration, you can just sort of take a topic, write about it, take a topic, write about it. Then when you want to kind of package it up into something a little bit more consumable, um, tell me if you agree with this. I feel like the three decisions that you have to make that occur to me are scope, audience, and format, right? So to change from like a stream of stuff into something that's more packaged, you need to decide what's in scope and what's out of scope. Like what are we covering or not? Who's the target audience? And then what's the format? And so like we had talked about, you know, in terms of the scope, right? In terms of um, you know, how, how global are we going to go? Are we going to talk about like everything to do with entrepreneurship? Or are we going to kind of assume that, you know, you're mostly focused on like SaaS and software entrepreneurship, right? And we, we talked about who's the target audience. Is it people who are ready to build right now, who are like ready to get going on their idea and they want accountability buddies to go, or is it people who are more entrepreneur curious, right? Who could be like a much wider top of funnel, um, who, you know, or just want to learn about entrepreneurship, but maybe have no idea what they want to build or if they even ever want to do it. Um, and then like, what would the format be, you know, kind of like cohort based course or your, you know, at your own pace course or some other hybrid thing like that. Does that sound right to you? Like the three key questions or is there yeah. No, I think, I think these are exactly the three that we need to answer. There's probably going to be more that will yeah. come up along the way too, because, you know, I can already think of a couple of things beyond these things that, that mm -hmm. might be interesting to us. Price what do you think is that? an interesting one, right? But what is it? like right. price, like, uh, price. Com, com, like how much, how much this product would be or, yeah. um, like language even <laughs> starts mm. with that too. Like the, the, but yeah. these are other things that let's talk about the three. Do you just want to have a, like a quick 
um, yeah. where we are with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in, in terms of scope, I found one thing very interesting in writing about all these things. And I'm, I'm just going to like re really roughly name the things that I've written about just so that it's, it's clear. I wrote about the fundamentals of a calm business. I wrote about the fundamentals of a calm SaaS business. That was my mm -hmm. next article because I noticed, hmm, bit of a general scope. Let's go deeper. And, and that's yeah. already kind of, that's the theme that I, that I want to talk about here, like zooming in. Then I talked about business model for business models for a calm SaaS business, then entrepreneurial strategies, like how to set up a business like this, then infrastructure, the tech choices of a calm SaaS business, market mm -hmm. analysis, problem discovery, figuring out what people need done, solution exploration, how can I solve this? And then product development for a calm SaaS business, then pricing for a calm SaaS business, and finally operating a calm SaaS business. These mm -hmm. have been the articles that I've written altogether, roughly two to 3,000 words each. And mm -hmm. I found that for scope, this is already a lot. Every single one of these things deserves a multi, multi hour. It's a weird, weird thing to measure this in hours, but like a deep dive in some capacity, yeah. right? You could mm -hmm. easily talk about pricing with experts and, and panels and all kinds of examples for half a day and touch most of the points, but not all, even mm -hmm. just in the, in the confines of the, this calm SaaS bootstrapped business that yeah. we want to talk about. And I feel okay. that's kind of where we should be because calm business is wonderful. SaaS business is great. Bootstrap business is also great, but the intersection of them is where we have the most impact with what we can do. And mm -hmm. because SaaS is what we both know, calm is what we both know. And the, you know, the bootstrap world is also where we want to be and where I guess it's, it's both useful for you and me. Because I don't yeah. talk to AC funded founders much, and your uh, business interest is aligned with mm -hmm. bootstrapping. So these these things kind of need to be considered. So I think our scope can easily like focus in on this. Should we say yeah. software, or is SaaS an important distinction? Ooh, that's interesting. I think we should not necessarily limit ourselves to SaaS, even yeah. though. And, and oh yeah, I'm, I'm I'm finding my thought again. The the thing is, is always easier to extrapolate a generic idea from a specific one than the other way around as yeah. a student, right? As a student, I can see, okay, this is an example of a larger theme. Okay. The theme is obvious, but if you have just the theme, it's kind of hard to figure out the example without any prior knowledge. So I think, um, we could well focus on SaaS and other software founders would just understand that yeah, maybe it's not recurring revenue, but I have like the equivalent to a lifetime deal in a SaaS is just a single price model, right? You can, can find these equivalents easily, um, but it's probably better for the, the, the comprehension to keep it more detailed and focused on a SaaS business. Again, mm -hmm. just a thought, not necessarily a decision at this point. What do you think about this? I think I, I think I, I like the principles you're applying there in terms of we have to start narrow just to even get to the finish line, right? If you don't get mm -hmm. like kind of ruthlessly narrow, you, you will just find yourself in this ever expanding, you know, scope creep. Right. Um, I do think, I, I think if we were doing this like a few years ago, I would have said easy choice, just call it SAS and everyone can extrapolate yep. from it. One of the things I'm now thinking about is making me a little bit hesitant is I think there's a huge opportunity coming for things that are fundamentally solving the same jobs as SaaS, but that are actually kind of like tech enabled servicey type businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of opportunity set for the next wave of entrepreneurs, whereas Six years ago, you might have said, I'm going to start a, you know, a specific industry focused kind of help desk software, right? And it's going to be SaaS, very clearly SaaS. I think a lot of opportunities are going to be, I'm going to use some sort of blend of um, services, offshoring, AI, and in-house technology to provide customer support for industry. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we could sort of tackle that with almost all the same answers, <laughs> um, except for maybe the literal like tech stack, even though even that would be pretty similar because you, you would just be using it yourself instead of kind of exposing it to your customers. Um, so I'm a little inclined to sort of say something a little closer to like software. Um, you know, uh, I rewrite yeah. all my articles. <laughs> it's just like find and replace SaaS and just put software in there. I, I like it. 
I yeah, I like uh, the I like this idea because we we should maybe just rebrand what SaaS means. Maybe it's not software as a service, but service and a software <laughs> something. Oh, yeah. Just completely oh, take the acronym. Sure, that's coming out of this is SaaS is over, right? You know, <laughs> like, um, that is bad. But yeah, I think software software will still kind of encapsulate who we're talking to, which are technical people or people yeah. building tech enabled or tech producing businesses. Mm -hmm. um, that makes makes sense. I, I like the idea of not kind of pigeonholing ourselves into something at this point, because mm -hmm. people will know that SaaS is a software term, but people who build other software things might feel excluded. That, and yeah. then it kind of leads us like from scope right into audience, right? Because mm -hmm. this, this is kind of where, well, who is this for? Is yeah. this for all these SaaS founders that have a recurring revenue software business that you guys like to invest in? Or mm. is this for people who are building things that might create recurring revenue like situations or just revenue, you know, mm. money in the first place that is not as investable maybe, but still empowering them to go from financial insecurity into financial security. But where along those kind of the, the spectrum would you like to see your yourself or the, the project itself? So for me, one of the whole reasons to introduce this project among the various priorities and ways that, you know, I'm spending my time and, and our fund is spending our time is to break out of, you know, just our sort of narrow investment thesis, right? So, you know, everything else that we do is targeted at investable companies. And the goal here is to be a little more wider top of funnel, right? To, to sort of capture folks' attention and, um, nudge them in this general direction, even if they're not necessarily, you know, headed directly down a fit for something we can invest in. Um, so I'm, I, I view a goal of audience here to be uh, wider than, you know, strictly something that I'm curious to be invested in, um, or, or that's, you know, very likely to be that. Um, yep. uh, yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that? Makes what, sense. What else we need to consider about audience? I feel like audience and format is something that was sort of, we, we went back and forth and like these two things are kind of intertwined. Like there's no right answer to them. It's like the audience defines the format or the format defines the audience and vice versa. It's like, if yeah, you go really wide. You obviously can't do like a cohort based thing, or maybe you can't, I don't know, but you know, you, you tend to be more like you need to do it at your own pace thing. If you're not filtering people down by, they have an idea ready to go you know, sort of thing. It, right. Um, yeah. Like, the, how do you think these, about two, these two fields intersect very much also on the like accessibility level, like who mm -hmm. is allowed in there, right? Because the yeah. moment you go into a cohort situation, you, you have some kind of exclusionary requirement. You need mm -hmm. to boil it down to a smaller group, which isn't necessarily bad because it increases the chances of adoption of the knowledge and actually seeing things through, which is conversion rate, I guess, for an educator, how many of your students actually get to the point where they can apply the knowledge that they have, which would be nice to see. But then again, the knowledge itself might be helpful beyond that one particular iteration that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So how accessible do you want it to be? How globally accessible do you want it to be? Do you want to charge um, a, a high kind of a limit amount of money that only allows certain people with a certain budget in there? Mm -hmm. existing businesses already revenue uh, producing businesses or something mm -hmm. it's complicated on my end can only tell you what i would love to see is to make it as as accessible as possible yeah in the first iteration and then yeah. have a funnel into something that allows people who are really willing to commit into something that th that then takes them by the hand and leads them more in a more guided way yeah throughout or through their journey that, that's two parts, I guess, which makes this an interesting two part of it. Right. Yeah, that's that's what I would like to see to like to, to be the top of the funnel, to be as broad as possible, also like globally accessible, that people not just in the states and Canada or the UK can afford that product, but also in India, Malaysia, China, wherever, right, and in, in every single part of the world, because we have things to share that are kind of um, generalizable into almost any kind of economy. Yeah, you know, you, you you've done some like people. PPP based pricing stuff, haven't mm -hmm. you? Like dynamic pricing. Yeah. How has that worked out? Yeah. Oh, that worked out super well. Like, yeah. I it, it has it has two effects. First off, you you make more sales, not necessarily more revenue, but more sales. And uh -huh. in the info product world or the educational product world, re, uh, the revenue of a, a thing is important, but the amount of reviews and feedback that mm -hmm. you get on it 
is equally important. And that mm -hmm. obviously is way higher if you have more people taking the thing. And right. I got so many positive uh, pieces of feedback from people telling me, you're the first person that ever did this. And this is the first thing I can afford. Two, wow. two, two ideas here. Yay, right? First thing they can actually afford. And often it was, this is the first thing I don't have to steal, which is a uh, whole other level of making things accessible, right? Yeah. I, mean, I come from the Napster generation. I know what it means to potentially, not committing to any uh, admittance here, mm -hmm. download things that maybe people shouldn't have downloaded back then. But sure. as a creator, it is great to see that people will take their hard earned money and, and particularly in, in third world economies that is really hard earned and put it, put it towards something that is um, an investment in themselves, not just sure. a necessity, but an investment. So mm -hmm. PPPP has been wonderful for me and the people in my community, because I have a pretty huge following in the non-Western world because of this. Mm -hmm. And because I also talk to people like a peer, right? Like I, I try to engage people on, our level, like trying to be one of everybody else. And that, that kind of helped with that too. So yes, mm -hmm. we should definitely do that. If that, um, is possible on the platform slash using the solution that we end up using for this. Yeah. Cool. Okay. But I think it feels like we're on the same page here in, in the sense that, you know, we should, at least as a starting point, we should start first with the, the sort of widest audience that we can in terms of, um, you know, folks who we just want to say, oh, you know, this is a way of doing entrepreneurship. You might just be someone who's never, you know, never started a business before. It's just generally thinking about it, you know, maybe feeling a little bit like you heard about the kind of Silicon Valley way of doing things and that didn't resonate with you, but you want to be an entrepreneur and you're just looking for a toehold into some other way to get started. Um, you know, and that's it, right? All the way up to people who are ready to go. Um, and then the format kind of necessarily needs to be accessible, open, probably, um, you know, probably at your own pace sort of thing. Right. So, you know, I think we're looking at more of a traditional, you know, series of videos kind of course format there, um, maybe with a community attached to it, but a, a, a lightly, you know, kind of maybe not super, super curated community. Right. Cause you know, that in and of itself is a lot of work. Actually, I'm curious about actually, no, let me ask you that. Like, let's say we go very wide, right? It's a course that's very affordable. You know, we have, we have thousands or tens of thousands of people that sign up for this thing. Is it opening Pandora's box to even add a community element to, to that? Or should we only have a second stage of the funnel that, that has a community aspect to it? That's an interesting point. And we've crossed the 40 minute mark, just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just wanted to point this out. But um, still, let, let's go because we can do whatever we want. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I recently talked to, to Rob Fitzpatrick about this because he's been um, busy investigating and doing research on uh, purpose driven communities, like communities that, you know, have a goal, that, that have a, um, an outcome. I think his yep. phrase is outcome oriented uh, communities. I would have to check this. So I'm not prepared to, to talk about this topic because I have not edited our podcast episode just okay. yet. But he's been been thinking, well, if we build communities, we might just as well build them towards the goal that everybody in this community wants to achieve. So we create mm. these kind of synergistic effects within the community. And I think for something like this, if that was the case, if we wanted to build a community that gets kind of driven towards that point of building your own calm business, which is kind of what it is, then a community from the start, even with a large uh, user base can help because people will find each other in that community and hopefully mm. with the right guidance and the right kind of structure, encourage each other and motivate each other to keep going, answer each other's questions because everybody is at a different stage. So they can, yeah. you know, have multiple perspectives for both from I have done this and I have not done this yet onto the same question. Super helpful. The only thing that comes with it is the necessity to moderate the community. Because right. any community on the internet completely derails into people talking about Hitler all the time if you don't have people in there making sure that there is some kind of order and structure to the behavior, yeah. which incurs costs either in time for the two of us, if we ever want yeah. to do this, or the people we hire to organize this community for us. So that's, I think that's the thing, right? It becomes a... Yeah, I, I think I think you're, you're dead on. And I think, um, I mean, we manage a community it's a much more tighter knit community of basically um uh all of our portfolio founders and then about 200 folks who are mentors in our community yeah. and um 
one thing I've learned from doing that for a couple of years is that it's very easy to underestimate just how challenging it is to to run a community and how how skilled of a, of a professional you need to do it well. Um, we've been very lucky to have really, really good people in that role in our community, but it, these folks are not like a dime a dozen, right? It's it's not like, you know, I mean, I don't want to disparage any particular industry, but like, it's not like you can just like throw up an ad and you get, you know, a dozen excellent candidates who are just going to hit it out of the park. And it's a lot of work that I don't realistically see either of us having time to do. So I think like, either almost pre finding that person, right, and saying, like, you know, the decision of whether or not to have a community is going to be dependent on whether we actually ahead of time find the perfect person to do it is maybe a good way to think about it or just taking it very seriously and and saying you know this thing needs to generate meaningful revenue such that we can you know hire a, a really great person because i think yeah. if you just sort of like try to hire some you know junior person fresh out of college with no experience and say you're the community manager now go it just doesn't work basically um yeah. Or AI. We, we find the AI community manager. We built the AI community manager. And then we have another SaaS product right on our hands right there. Now, obviously, it would be nice to have a person, right? To have a human being that also cares not just about um, like maintaining a community, but also the topic itself, which is that's the hard part, right? The hire is going to have to be somebody who likes software businesses, who wants them to be bootstrapped and self funded, independent, and calm, and loves people. And yeah. loves telling them to shut up and not talk about yes. Hitler all the time. You know, that, that, is a, that is a lot in one person that you have to find. So you're right. It, it should not stop us from doing the thing we want to do, right? The community itself is not the central part of the, the educational program. It can yeah. be a, a great extension, which is probably why universities work so well, right? You have the mm -hmm. educational part and the camaraderie among the students and the projects that they do with each other and stuff. And once we build a community, that could be part of it. Or... Again, second op option is do that later in a second kind of installment of this that is more um, small community centric, like more pods of people, maybe 20, 30 people, like, like classrooms really, and have people go through the, the whole journey in this, this cohort that they would be in. But I think wh how, whatever we choose, the educational content itself needs to be present for us to build a structured community around it. Mm -hmm. Do you think so too, or am I maybe putting the cart before the horse here? I think um, I think I'm on the same page. I mean, I think one thing that we've figured out is that this is a sort of independent variable, right? It's like we don't have to make a decision on this. At, you know, we have to decide some of those other things, right? Scope, audience, format. Um, this one, I feel like you know we can start to feel it out as we get towards the later phases of of getting ready to to launch it to make that decision on what kind of community there's going to be probably we can even get some feedback along the way you know as we're sort of publishing this i mean the absolute best thing would be literally sourcing the right person to run the community through this build and public process um which it would pretty much make the decision for me i think um but uh yeah i think we can we can probably like cross that bridge a little bit later because I think it would work either way, right? It, if it was just started off as a standalone thing with with no embedded community except you know organic discussions and places like Twitter and stuff like that, like that would be totally fine um, and a great starting point. Um, uh, yeah, this is one of those things where adding something later is a possibility because you have access to the people who take the course. Right? Yeah. You have email addresses, you have them on Twitter, and you probably um, can find other means to engage them through whatever kind of community notion document or whatever we're going to put in there as well. So totally. yes, I think that this is going to be one of those cases where somebody is listening to a podcast and gets a job. And I love this. This yeah. is cool. <laughs> this is awesome. But this is like, so, I I hope you give like sort of like meta, you know, one of the reasons why I like this is I think you know, we have a decent amount of experience in terms of, you know, navigating projects like this. And um, I, you know, just the sort of meta process of looking for things that you can kind of kick decisions down the decision tree is like a really useful skill for entrepreneurship because it's just so easy to get bogged down with a bunch of stuff, like really aggressively looking for like, this is great. We have a pretty good idea of this, but we don't need to decide it now. Like, boom, kick it down the road right? and only focus on the things that are truly kind of path dependent, you know, non-reversible decisions that have to be made is kind of the only way not to get overwhelmed in, in projects like these. So I, I like that we went down this road and we kind of arrived at have a good sense of it. Don't need to decide now. Let's 
tackle it later. <laughs> yeah, talking about baby steps, right? That's kind of what it is. And um, well, maybe let's let's end this very first episode of the Yet yeah, to Learn in podcast um, with maybe an actionable or yeah, an actionable item for both of us until next week. I kind of always like to uh, to know mm -hmm. what's going to happen. You know, do do you have anything particular that would bring this closer to fruition on your end? Um, I think maybe we can take the scope, audience, and format questions, um, and I can take a first pass at, like, basically, I think that should be, like, a, a sort of central document that we can refer back to over time. And we can edit it. It's not written in stone, you know, but, like, actually having a little bit more of a written out kind of thing, and, and we can basically have that for the next time we chat um, and just make sure that we have that set in stone. And then it feels to me like the next phase of this would be taking kind of some of the material that you've written and we already did an outline, but I think you did the outline before you started the, the, the article series. So it feels like it's time to go back to the outline question right? and say, okay, you know, everything that you've learned from that process now in light of these firm decisions on scope audience and format, what do we really think the outline should be is specifically within the context of, you know, scope, right? So really not just saying like topic, 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 but sort of saying like, this is going to be a one hour video on topic, right? And so we can sort of say like, oh, well, now this is 37 hours. We have to do, you know, a fraction of that, That's right? I think we're at that phase where we can kind of start to spec out um, yeah. the topics within a realistic scope and format. Do you think so? I agree. And I, I think I, I can I can dive into the data that I already have on uh, the things that I've already written and published because there are reader numbers, there are listener numbers, and there are clicks and all these things that I have on these cool. topics. So we can, you know, impact impactfully choose the things that people resonate with the most already. So I'm going to dive into those numbers and have them ready next week when we talk again. That would be so a good immediate step, actually, just analyzing that results before we dive into outlining. I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, if, if we have like people's yeah. uh, votes with their feet already, right, <laughs> might just as well use them in, in our decision-making process. Again, building in public, right? Feedback is yeah. central to the whole thing. So yeah. take the data that you already have and make choices from there. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, we have this has been minutes before we hit crazy. one hour. So I want to ask one last question, which is what are we going to do with this recording? Are we tweeting it out like an hour from now? Or what do you think? Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, why <laughs> it's, not? It's, it's, maybe um, for anybody who makes it through this now 51 hour and uh, 51 minute and, and 45 seconds recording name suggestions how about that Let, let's outsource this a little bit I, I i like anything that has the name calm in it that's that's what i like but hey if, if anybody has an idea and if anybody listens to this to this point well might just as well let us know and see what you find a fitting name for what this is already what do you think about that yeah oh and one more thing um i think in future versions of this we're going to carve out some time to talk about whatever not just quite so focused on we'll skip the whole right. meta analysis of the podcast we'll talk about common ba and then we'll talk about some other stuff if there's some stuff that you would love for arvin and i to riff on um also throw that at us yeah i will be talking a lot about my dog because that is my constant companion throughout my day and there will be a lot of things about writing and building and probably world of warcraft is going to be in there too and and photography i've been taking up that as a hobby so we will have a lot to talk about in the future um this has been a wonderful wonderful conversation already yeah i'm looking forward to seeing what people think about it super well then talk to you next week yeah see you next week <laughs>